everybody, it is your favorite day of the week. It is time for another episode of the Reality Reading Rainbow, where we talk about books by reality stars, especially those on Bravo, and try to make sense of them. I am Les Kirkendall Barrett, and of course, we have my lovely co-host here, Victoria Wood. Hello, Victoria. Hi, Les. How are you? I'm good, and I'm excited to talk about this next chapter. Or I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can do an imitation of it. Okay. Okay. Here we go. You were engaged nineteen times. You prostitution whore. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> we are talking about. The Real Housewives of New Jersey on the in the book, Not All Diamonds and Rose. And this chapter is called Flipping the Table. Yes. Wow. I mean, that was such an iconic impression. Way to start the show, Les. I love it. And yes, um, part four in Not All Diamonds and Rose is entitled Flipping the Table, The Real Housewives of New Jersey. This uh, franchise premiered on May 12th, 2009. And the quote to start the book, I think, is just very thematic of what we've come to know and also love about Jersey. And the quote is actually from Andy Cohen saying, family offered a new spin on the Housewives franchises. And I agree, because when I think of family, I think of Jersey. I think they have this very unique uh, point of view on the housewives because they're all related and, Mm -hmm. you know, they're all uh, allegedly financially well off and doing well. So to kind of see, you know, sisters-in-laws, you know, cousins, um, just, yeah, just extended families, in-laws, cousins. It's, it's very interesting and it makes for a good show. And also just to add, Jersey is one of those franchises that I not just live for the housewives, but I live for the house husbands. Yes. And I think they were the first ones to do that. Now, Jersey was one of these franchises. Like I watched it. But I was kind of eh about it until, like now I love it. Now I love it. But for me, it was definitely kind of a slow, I guess what would I describe, like a slow, like it was, I was slow to warm up to it. Right. Um, so it, so the cool thing is, is it basically sounds like the whole thing was kind of originated out of a beauty salon. <laughs> yes, that was quite interesting. And also, I, I think there's this common theme with Housewives where the shows had a different name or an idea before they decided, okay, we're going to make it Housewives because they were planning to call it something like the Ladies of New Jersey. Right. That was and, the working title, which was very interesting. And it came out around the time, because remember when, Jersey became hot because it was, um, uh, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name with Snooki and the situation and- um, Jersey Shore. Jersey Shore. And then there was Jersey Licious. So Jersey, everybody kind of jumped on the New Jersey bandwagon. And so I guess this was Bravo's take on it. Yeah, absolutely. And again, going back to your earlier point, this started in a salon. Uh, Jacqueline went to this salon, Danielle went to the salon, and the owner was approached to find some girls. They also go on to kind of say that Jacqueline and Dina were a win for the casting team because they were close friends, they were also sister, sister-in-laws. And that was, you know, again, an interesting dynamic. And I mean, when you think about Melissa and Teresa, now I understand why Melissa was so appealing. It's because of that sister-in-law dynamic. Right. And then I love that, and I I forgot about this, Dina and Caroline, two sisters, were married to two brothers. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I'm telling you, it's crazy. But yeah, just, um, I found my note here where they love the sister-in-law angle. 
you know so you're the outsider trying to work your way inside and um you know there's just a lot going on they loved Dina because she was glamorous she was that pretty girl in high school it seemed like everything would go right for her but then she has this mysterious you know husband uh floating around um Caroline and Dina again their sisters you know they're 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 11 they're two of 11 children they married brothers like you mentioned um so yeah it just it kept going on and then there's that iconic Caroline Manzo um saying you know about blood being thicker than water let me tell you this my family is as thick as thieves <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> It was also interesting to see that they loved Caroline. Like they actually liked her and their take on Caroline was she was the opposite. She wasn't trying to be glamorous. She wasn't trying right. to be rich. And for them, they found that interesting because they never had that kind of housewife. Um, what I found fascinating is when we think of Jersey, we think of Teresa and they love Teresa, by the way. But Jacqueline was the one who talked Teresa into joining. Yes. Because she was reluctant to join the franchise at first. But Jacqueline believed in her. And again, you know, that's one of those friendships I was very sad to kind of see go down the drain. But it was very just fascinating to see that Jacqueline was the one who talked Teresa into joining the Joe. Now, now what I found interesting is that it was all supposed to center around Dina. And they wanted Dina, they thought Dina was gonna be like the knee of this yes. franchise. Yes, yeah. It, it's just interesting how they have these perceptions comparing it to previous franchises and so on. The last thing I'm gonna say on casting though, was the Dolores of it all. <gasps> My Dolores Catania, I love her. I love Dolores as well. And she was almost a cast member. She backed out. She had cold feet. But most importantly, though, her boyfriend at the time didn't like the idea of her doing, um, you know, doing the show. And she was saying after she had her first interview, they started, you know, to ask her all these questions about her friends. And she would never say anything bad about her friends. And I mean, that to me just sounds so quintessential Dolores, just being very loyal. And she also mentions then getting a call the next day to say, well, what did you say about this one? What did you say about that? And she didn't like the way it felt because she didn't want to be that person talking about friends. And when you look at Dolores today on the show, you can tell she's so true to that kind of personality. And you know what I think too? I think that timing is everything. So mm -hmm. I like it now because the selling point for Dolores right now is, you know, her relationship with her ex-husband, Frank. Right. You know, who I don't think that they were getting along back then. And now, like the biggest entertaining thing about her is the fact that her and Frank live in the same house, but they're like best friends you know and mm. and he watches her date and so they on. have like this banter and then Frankie you know her hot son is like older like so it I like I think that if she would have joined back then yeah we wouldn't have her here today still and I don't think she would have been as fun and likable as she is now because I think right now just the quirkiness of her relationship and just all of that, plus her mothering energy, I think that's what makes her work. Yeah, absolutely. So on the note of Dolores backing out, I think this is our last pointer on the note of casting, is well, with Dolores being out, they needed a new cast member. And in comes Daniel Staub. Ooh. <laughs> so everyone, if you're ever up for a housewife show, this is a cautionary tale. When you recommend someone to be on your housewife show, make sure you know them well first. <laughs> <laughs> I found it super interesting because Carlos King was saying he was mesmerized by Daniel. She had tons of baggage, but she was open about it. 
Um, they thought she would be good for the show because she was a divorcee. Um, you know, she was looking to do something new. And I mean, even Danielle said herself, you know, if she didn't get divorced, if she was still married, she probably wouldn't have done the show, but she was looking for a fresh start. And she was sold on the idea, oh, we're going to be a group of friends, you know, doing a TV show. It's going to be great. And of course, uh. <laughs> we know what happened. And that's all I'm going to say on casting. But overall, Les, to kind of wrap this segment, what were your thoughts on casting and reading about it here in uh, the book? Well, first of all, one of the things that I'm finding interesting about like all of the chapters in general is what the first what the what the producer's vision was for the show and how it turned out because so far in every chapter what they had envisioned actually didn't turn out and took on a whole life of its own because it still fascinates me that this was supposed to be centered around Dina and Dina was supposed to be like the breakout star where it turned into Teresa who didn't even want to do the show. Yeah. You know? I know. I know. It's just super fascinating. Um, the dynamics, the projections, and then of course, watching the show and seeing how things played out. But at the end of season one is really what made New Jersey iconic. It's the table flip. Teresa going, you know, <laughs> bonkers on uh, Danielle. The fact that, you know, all this stuff about Danielle came out, you know, there's this book, just so much going on. Um, I found it interesting, just everyone's take on Danielle present day talking for the book. I mean, Carlos King was saying that even back then, they all felt bad for Danielle. It's just she really didn't articulate what she was feeling uh, very well because the truth is, and I could, I could see it now. I'm going to be honest and say, back when I was watching the show that first time, I was on the prostitution whore bandwagon, you know, flipping the table. This woman is crazy. Who is she kind of thing. But re-watching the show, and I re-watched it last year, I was like, whoa. I was mean to Danielle. I think she just really wanted to fit in with the group. She wanted to be one of the cool kids and the cool kids are saying, I don't want to hang out with you and I don't want to be friends with you. So it was quite interesting to say, to see, sorry, that that was a sentiment from the production side and they all agreed. Danielle just, she chose to go down a darker path. You know, she, she got super defensive. She, she, she wasn't able to articulate her feelings well. Was Danielle a good villain? Yes. Did Danielle help to cement the franchise? I'm going to say yes, because had she not been there, had she not, you know, created waves for Jersey to culminate the way it did at the end, I think it would be a completely different show. Because if you think about it, if we never had Danielle and we had Dolores, I don't think we would have had the blow up that was right. season one that put Jersey on the map. Now, I got to tell you, so before you became a co-host on this podcast, yes, I read Danielle's book. Okay. So during when the show first aired, mm -hmm. I actually felt sorry for Danielle. Ooh, because see, I, I didn't. thought, you know, because she wanted to fit in. You know, uh -huh. they're a family, so there's no way that that she could penetrate it. But after reading her book okay. and seeing her shenanigans now, right. I look back and I say, oh my God, the Manzos were right the entire time. And they were right to be afraid of her. Isn't that interesting? I kind of love this, that we have so opposite perspectives because when I watched it, I was on their side. I'm like, who is this woman? get rid of her. This is awful. And I was just so with it, but you felt empathy for her at that point. Yes. Oh yeah. Wow. And it's like the roles have flipped. It's like, I'm watching it. I was like, Oh my God, they were mean girls. What kind of person was I? <laughs> and here's what's crazy. So reading these books, mm -hmm. I think part of it, 
a part of these books, and I don't know what your opinion is, is for us, A, for us to get to know the women better, B, what makes them tick, and then normally, since this, it's different with this book since it's a big general book on everyone, but yeah. what goes through my mind when doing episodes of this podcast is, is the woman acting on the show like how she presents herself in the book. Right. And so when I read this book, my conclusion was, oh my God, Danielle's a horrible human being. Yeah. And that was after reading her book. So like her book <laughs> didn't, didn't do her any favor. Wow. Okay, now I'm thinking I need to go read Danielle's book. Oh my gosh, this is crazy. But again, super interesting. And the one thing I'm going to say to kind of close this bit out is the table flip made Jersey iconic. The Danielle of it all made Jersey iconic and it cemented the franchise we have today. So yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, the next thing I have flagged is Andy and Teresa and that whole situation at the reunion where Teresa lost it with Danielle and she actually pushed Andy. Yes. I was like, whoa, that was insane. Like I could tell she was really, really, really upset. But it was, it was a lot. That's all I'm going to say. What were your thoughts? Okay. I, the push, watching the push, it is kind of funny. Because she literally just kind of grabbed him like he was like a three-year-old and just kind of toy sat him down. <laughs> It's like he was a rag doll. He was a toy. It was just like, move, <laughs> go. <laughs> oh my God. And the look on his face is priceless. Like he's like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was just, I don't know. Now here's Andy, another one. Uh, sorry, what? Oh, no, I was going to say, I'll, I'll let you go first. Oh, I was just going to say, reading Andy's thoughts on it was quite interesting. He was saying, like, he was in shock. It just, it never, <laughs> it never made sense. He found it hysterical, which I'm like, okay, great. But when it aired, everyone knew, I mean, we all know who Andy Cohen is, but he's alluding to the fact everyone was just mentioning it after the show aired. It was just all about him, you know, being pushed and, he saying, well, that thing kind of helped make me famous. So that was just very funny. Um, but for Danielle, obviously, um, that was the end for her. She actually said while she was sitting on the couch, she said she didn't want a renewal. Obviously, her time um, was done on the Housewives. So, you know, that was it. But when Danielle left, they decided, hey, we need to increase the family on this show. We love the family. Let's bring in more family. So instead of focusing on the Loritas this time, they went to Teresa's side of the family. And here comes Melissa Gorga, the sister-in-law. I'm telling you, on Jersey, they love sister-in-laws. They love cousins. They love, you know, those family members who are not that close, but they're within, you know, touching distance. Now, the deal is with this, though, yeah, they went to Teresa's family members, but they didn't tell Teresa. And that, to me, is shade. Yes. I'm sorry. That is shade. And I know this is still a debate in the New Jersey housewife universe. And it's still a debate between Teresa and Melissa about who told who and who didn't tell who and all these different things. Honestly, I think they did that to create a wedge and a rift they don't want two sister-in-laws getting along and you know there was obviously that history and that tension that they could sense between Melissa and Teresa and both Joes so I think it was intentional and I believe Teresa so Melissa didn't tell her I and that. remember that first episode the premiere episode where it was a brawl at the baby's, at Melissa's baby's christening. Yes. Not a yes. fight. It was, it was a brawl. Yep. Absolutely. For sure. It was, it was insane. But it made for good TV though. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah. And I agree with you. I, I, 
am on team Teresa on that because I would be pissed too if I was on a show at this time what she had been on it for two years three years yeah yeah three years and so I would be pissed if my in-laws took a gig and sneak attacked me with it oh a hundred percent which is what I'm saying I believe Teresa I'm team Teresa and Melissa should have told, but again, my God's telling me production told them not to say anything. Oh, I'm sure they, I'm sure they told them not. And that was part of the whole I'm sure deal. they did. So anyway, that's like the major casting shift that happened in Jersey. You know, losing Dolores, gaining Danielle, losing Danielle, g- gaining Melissa and Joe. And it, it has been pretty concrete um, for some time. But the next major thing in the book that I want us to discuss is the never before seen, known, heard of fact about cast members being arrested in the Dominican Republic. Like what the F? I had no idea. Les, what were your reactions when when you- Okay, now this came up, this this came up last, if you haven't listened to our um, episode with Dave Quinn, our friend who wrote this book, go back and listen to that. Oh, and by the way, if you're new to the podcast, welcome. Anyway, (laughs) um, this shot actually, and then remember Dave was saying that it just, someone said it as like a throwaway and he picked up on this and delved into it. This, okay, so this was around the time that was the season that, all of a sudden, Teresa and the Manzos were no longer friends. And they had been tight. They had been tight, 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 tight up until this. And I know there was like a little tension because, you know, Teresa, like Teresa's brother and sister-in-law, Joe and Melissa, and then her cousin, Kathy, and Kathy's family joined the cast too. So there was a little tension there because The Manzos were kind of in the middle, but I never understood how they just totally fell out. And this explained why they totally fell out. Because basically they got arrested and it was Teresa's fault. (laughs) It was all Teresa's fault why they got arrested. So I don't blame them for being pissed at. No, I know, but I think I'm just still lost at the fact that no one talked about it. No. It I guess they were told quiet. not to. They were told not to. I know, but it was just, ugh. I just, wow. It was he, just crazy. Because even Dave said that when he found out about it, he had to assure them that he had spoken to Andy Cohen and Andy Cohen gave them permission to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, wow, this was just quite interesting. I mean, just reading the whole incident unfold. I mean, I loved it. I was just there for it. I was like flipping the pages as we were going by. But yeah, it was just, I think for me, it's just knowing that they're reality stars and it was even alluded in the book about them being reality stars and you know them thinking they're all that in the club and da 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 that someone would leak it so that's what i'm saying it's just it's wild to me it never saw the light of day now i gotta say this i was never really a fan of the manzos yeah Mm -hmm. but this incident yes made me a man a fan of the manzos because Part of the reason why they were in a fist fight is because one of the producers was black. One of the people they were fighting called the producer the N word and the Manzos were sticking up for it. Yeah. So I, I, I actually appreciated that. Um, so now sure. I like the Manzos. <laughs> same, same. But I appreciate the fact that, you know, they stood up for this producer and yeah, that's ultimately what led to the fight. But again, we're not going to say anything else. You have to read it. I mean, the Teresa of it all, right? the Manzas of it all, the producer, just everything. I mean, again, I still can't believe this never saw the light of day. No, no Reddit threads, no tweets, nothing. Well, so. here's the deal. And this is something that I guess we could find out. 
I know in some, I, I know people who have been on reality shows before and there are clauses in there. There are like clauses in there that like, if you say something, you will be fined like a million dollars and like seriously, like crazy amounts like that. I mm -hmm. wonder if that was the deal with them. Like if you say something, you're gonna have to, you're gonna be fined like a crazy amount of money. Cause I know for me, if I was gonna be fined a million dollars, I'd keep my mouth shut too. Yeah, absolutely. True, true. That's fair. But yeah, you guys, you have to read it, get the book. Um, oh, and I will give you a little marker. So you can read about the arrest if you just wanna go straight to the mess. It's page 258. So just go straight to page 258 and you'll get into all the tea. Yes. And, and without without spilling anything, <clears throat> so I can so you can have I'll I'll let you have your reading experience. All I'm gonna say is this is the one franchise they love brawls because remember they had they had the brawl and the Christian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This yeah. was a brawl. Remember yeah. they went on vacation and the Joes had a brawl. Yeah. The hotel. They're they loved to brawl. They're always fighting. They're always <laughs> fighting. I swear. Tell me, tell me a situation when they're never fighting. They're always fighting. It's either with fists or mouse or hair yanking. Just some crazy shit. They're always fighting. Right. But the, but the next big thing in the Jersey um, chapter is stating the obvious. Well, first, I'm going to give a little side note. Season six, because the Manzos, I think they left season five. So after the Manzos left, specifically after Caroline left, it opened the door for Dina to come back on the show. Yes. Because Dina had left the show. And every season they were knocking on her door. Dina even says Andy even showed up with Rosé to talk her into coming back to the show. So, but she never wanted to be on with Caroline for reasons we'll talk about in the after show, okay? But I just wanted to say... Dina came back on the show, which would have been a big thing on its own. One of my favorite you know, taglines of all time, namaste, bitches. Namaste. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, it would have been huge. But despite, you know, the new additions, despite everything that was going on, the biggest storyline around season six was about Teresa and Joe and their legal troubles and just the entire struggle that was captured on film. I mean, I actually just got chills about it because that was huge. You know, to see that play out on television yes. with or OG Jersey girl, Teresa, it was, it was, it was crazy. It, I, I, honestly, I know now we live in a time where it's like housewives, house husbands and everyone's just being sued left and right tax problems fraud this that all these you know allegedly let me just say that everything just coming out here in the wash but for me back then that was huge I mean Les how did you feel well and and, and know that this is the one season out of any I think this was the most hated season out of any franchise because remember, this is back when they had like the twins, Jim and Amber, who were both just awful people. So this is the one season that like, I think seriously almost wrecked the show. Yeah. To the point that when Teresa went to jail, they waited until she got out of jail to continue filming. Yeah, absolutely. But, but yeah, at the time, this was like, at the time this was big. Because, you know, uh, what, what can I say? You know, uh, Teresa walks so Jen Shaw and Erica could run, you know? <laughs> True. And I think what was extra shocking about this whole season wasn't the fact that she was going to court, the fact that she was, she was found guilty and went to jail. I think that to me was, because I, I remember thinking, uh, she's going to get out of it. Uh, you know, it's not going to be bad. And the fact that she was found guilty and went to jail, went to prison, prison, yep. that to me, I think was the most shocking part. 
It was wild. It was, you know, to add another layer onto it, you know, Caroline was saying all these things about yeah. Teresa. Yes. And I don't think it helped. I'm not saying it was at fault, but I'm just saying it, it didn't help the situation. And we'll definitely talk more about it um, in the after show. Also, um, Amber and the twins never came back to the show as well. You know, after that, it's just, you know, Dina also said sayonara. She's out, you know, she left as well. Um, it was just a lot though. Um, producers were very confused at the end of season six. Um, they didn't know what was going on with the show. You know, they had all these different experiments. Oh, let's add this person. Let's do that. And, you know, it was super, super, super hard. And then, of course, obviously, for the show to kind of go on hiatus um, after Teresa went to jail was quite something. Um, you know, kind of to wrap Jersey, we also had the introduction of Siggy Flicker. We uh, had Jackie come on the uh, show. Dolores finally, as a housewife, coming on the show. You know, we have Margaret Josephs coming yay! on the show. I mean, I don't like Margaret, so you and I are going to be going back and forth. But that's back when Margaret had pigtails. <laughs> she did. No, honestly, the powerhouse and pigtails line, I was with it. I actually was with it. <laughs> so, And then wasn't uh, this when Danielle, did Danielle Stout come back this season or the next season? It was the Margaret season. It was season eight. So we- when Margaret came on the show, Danielle came back on the show as well um, because we had that Danielle um, dynamic because at the end of season six is when Teresa went away. Then after that, um, you know, then Jersey went on hiatus for two years. This is the reason why the seasons get confusing for me. So Teresa went to, to jail season six. Sorry, Teresa went away. What am I saying? Teresa went away at the end of season six. The show went on hiatus for two years. Then Jersey started again at season seven with Teresa returning home. And that's when they added Dolores to the show as an official housewife. The next addition was Siggy Flicker. Boom. Uh And then after season seven, you know, they they were really trying to catch up because again, they were on hiatus for two years. And then season eight rolled around. And um, at that point, we had Danielle return. We also now had the new face, which was Margaret Josephs. And the biggest feud of that season was between Margaret and Siggy. Team and- Margaret. <laughs> and in the end of season eight, Siggy left the show. So Siggy left, and that's when we have two brand new castmates where we have Jackie and Jennifer. And I'm just going to tell everyone on the show right now, I love me some Jennifer, okay? I love Jennifer. I'm here for Jennifer Aiden and her whole family. Team Jackie. (laughs) (laughs) This is going to be fun, honestly. (laughs) Less loving Margaret, me not liking Margaret so much. He's team Jackie. I'm team Jen. This is going to be fun, you guys. It really is going to be fun. But the season, um, season nine was also the end of Teresa and Joe's relationship. And season 10 was when all the cast kind of came together. And I think the show itself at the end of this book, I will say kind of, it kind of went through a full circle moment. Less, I think Jersey is really a special franchise. I really want us to di- to dive deep into it some more in the after show. But just in summary, what's your thoughts on Jersey? How were you feeling after this chapter? You know, what's well, in your mind? To, because to be honest, I think out of all of the franchises, Jersey is the one where I have taken a journey with who I like and who I don't. Like, for example, I started out hating Teresa. Now, this current season, I love Teresa, you know? Um, uh, You know, I already spoke about how I started feeling sorry for Danielle Staub. I now think Danielle Staub is a horrible human being. 
started out not liking the Mantos. Love the Mantos. So I think this is the seat, this is the one franchise where I've literally been on a roller coaster ride with the actual franchise. And my, you know, and this is the one where my opinions have shifted the most. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, the thing I loved about Jersey is, again, it's a theme of family. It started with family and it's ending with family for me. I've loved seeing how the families have evolved. I mean, had you told me Teresa and Juicy Joe would have gotten a divorce, I'd be like, no, what are you talking about? You know, it felt so unreal to me. Um, you know, just seeing the different housewives come on and off the show. Um, that was very interesting because I'm really trying to think of a franchise where you have housewives coming on and off um, as much as they did Jersey. But I think the reason it worked was because they were family. They really were, with the exception of Danielle, obviously. But for the most part, going and coming, the Dina, you know, the, the Carolines, the, just everyone. But um, Jersey is a great franchise. I think it's fabulous. Um, and yeah, I can't wait to talk more in the after show. And, you guys. and let, me, let me say this before we go, that we could talk about more in the after show. One thing that I do think is sad though, mm. is so when it comes to the Manzos, so basically in the Manzos, Dina and Caroline are not speaking and haven't spoken since they've been on the show. I think Jacqueline, there are a bunch of them are fighting with Jacqueline. Uh, on uh, Teresa's side, she and Kathy no longer speak. So in a way, as much as it's been about family, it's also wrecked the families involved. Absolutely. But see, that's family dynamics. Like families get wrecked in real life. The difference is it doesn't happen on TV. <laughs> so right. I think uh, that's the major difference for sure. So everybody, that is it for this episode, but we're not done because on Patreon, we have the after show where we do an even deeper dive and get into the gossip and just let it all hang out about the chapter that we just talked about. And if you want to become a Patreon member, you can actually go on to Patreon and go to the Reality Reading Rainbow and Basically, I've changed the tiers, so it doesn't matter if you give a dollar or 20, you have access to the app. So just know that going in, and, you know, because I understand, come on, we're still post-COVID, but COVID is still around, so I get it. A lot of, there are a lot of people out there who aren't working, who don't have cash, get it 100%. So whatever you can give for Patreon, works for the after show and if you can't hey continue coming here because our you know your presence is our present oh and then one more thing about that i actually uh last week released uh a, the after show just so you could kind of get a taste on what we're going to be doing so if you if you are interested go back to the last episode and give it a listen and if you like it that's what we're going to be doing on patreon uh, anything else, Victoria? No, I think that's it. So see you guys in Ooh. the after show. Ooh. And One more thing, and I've been really bad about this. I have something that I need to promote, actually. If you are in the Fresno area, I'm going to be doing a show. Um, I wrote a one-man show called uh, The Real Black Swan, Confessions of America's First Black Drag Queen. And it tells the story of William Dorsey Swan, true story of a former slave who became the queen of drag in Washington, D.C. And so if you are interested and you are in the Fresno area, uh, it's part of the Rogue Festival. And you can find out information on that on www.fresnorogue.com. And I will also put it on my website, uh, www.letsbelbera.com. Now, anything else? No, I think that's it. And I can't wait to talk to you guys over in the after show. And the next episode, we'll be talking about the real housewives of these beats. All right. So until next time, see you later.